Um, hello and welcome to another episode of Fekava Vet Chat. My interviewee tonight is uh, uh, someone who studied at the same university as I did, uh, the Tierzicher Hochschule in Hannover, but uh, she was a little bit cleverer than me and uh, she finished a little bit earlier than me um, already in 1982. After finishing her course at vet school, she uh, didn't go at least for a long time, but we will find out about that into clinical practice, but she specialized on microbiology. This, uh, within a short period of time, led her to become the owner and also the CEO of one of Europe's largest veterinary laboratories, LaboClean, which is now operating from its headquarter in Bad Kissing in Germany with several other smaller labs all over Europe. So LaboClean is a household name for most of our colleagues all over Europe, but there is more behind it and especially more behind the person I'm talking about, Dr. Elizabeth Müller. Good evening at Fikava Vetchep, Elizabeth Müller. Hi. Hi, good evening, everybody. Good to be here. <laughs> and so I really like to talk and I like to chat with Wolfgang because we know each other for quite a long time. And That's we really met each other through Fikava, which is true, isn't it? Yes, yeah, that, that, that's true. Although I, I just thought today, it's a little while ago that we met the last time. Was it at the BSAVA Congress in, uh, uh, in Birmingham? At least there we met. I remember that we, we met there with... Um, uh, who's a colleague who does the um, uh, vet uh, pet vet um, uh, a conference? Um, that is uh, Thomas Steidel. Thomas Steidel, exactly. But my my memory is that the very last time we met was in um, Toronto, small World Small Animal Congress. Right. Yeah, could be. That's right. That's right. All right. So long ago, two thousand nine. Beautiful meeting. Really, where has, really where great has, program. Yeah, yeah, but where, has, where, where has the time gone? Blimey. Mm. So, Elizabeth, we, we, we both studied in Hannover. Um, do you also originate from the north of Germany or where, how, <laughs> how did that come about with Hannover? Why not? Because now Laboclean is in Bad Kissing, in, which is in Bavaria, the northern part of Bavaria. So most of the people who work here have studied in Munich. So how did that come about with you in Hannover? Oh, okay. So originally I'm from Bremen, which is further north, and that's sea climate actually from Germany. And um, then I decided actually I wanted to study biology, and I realized that I would be um, an out of work biologist because so many jobs were not around for biologists at that time. And um, I, I had this vision of me being a taxi driver with a no good idea of, of directions and where to go to. I thought, no, you've got to find an alternative. And the alternative should be something that was related to science because I really loved science. And um, then I kind of peeked into veterinary business mm -hmm. and uh, worked in a small animal practice. Mm -hmm. Loved that. Mm -hmm. I had this awful um, moment where I had to write down the Shivava breed and I made up something awful but otherwise I really loved being in the practice I loved working with animals I loved working with people that was a connection that was perfect for me and the the um, science part behind it I really liked I liked the handcraft stuff that is belonging to that as well and then I thought okay but you have to go to university for for continuing that so I was very clear with my mindset going into small animal practice later on Mm. And from Bremen, first thing was that Hanover had a very good reputation, especially for small animals at that time. And oh, well, uh, I would say B Berlin was at the time possibly better, and Hanover was more horses, I thought. Oh, so, I don't know. I, I, I'm not totally, yeah, I don't totally agreed. agree with you. Yeah. But anyway, okay. then I, Hanover was the first one going down south, really, or going. Yeah. But then yeah. at that time, we had split north and um, uh, western part of Germany, and Berlin University was in the eastern part, and that was very cumbersome traveling. So that I, I kind of kicked that out of my mind. I didn't really want to mm. go through 
a different country that has mirrors behind below the car when you travel. And, um, so I, I moved to Hanover. That, well, that was my first choice. Uh, I was extremely lighthearted, let's put it that way. Um, we, we have this file that you put it, have to put in where you what you want to study, where you want to study, first, second, third preference. Mm -hmm. At that time, I um, was an interim or pair in Norway between finishing school and starting to study. Uh, picked up the paperwork, went to the local shop uh, because it was a small town, and I filled in. I made my crosses and filled in that paper and said, "Okay, you want to do veterinary medicine? That's done. You want to go to Hanover? That's done." I didn't give a second choice. I didn't give anything at all. I just okay. made that off, yeah. and I got my first choice. So. It happened. And that it was happened. definitely my first movement to the south. That was continental, moving to continental climate and moving to the south. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The far south from, from Bremen to Hanover. It's Just imagine what I went through. <laughs> I, I was born in Kiel, so even further north from you, 250 <laughs> kilometers. You know, a Norwegian would laugh about that. So these distances, that's Absolutely. nothing. But that was my, my, my movement to continental climate and into the south, 120 kilometers. Yeah. And from then on, I mean, going through the south of Bavaria wasn't really such a big thing, was it? <laughs> no, yeah, that's true. So, but then, but when you qualified, so you uh, went pretty much straight away into microbiology or um, how did this, or did you first do any any uh, clinical work then with small animals or with large animals or mixed practice or something like right. that? So I was still determined that I wanted to go into small animal practice. And I wanted to do my doctor's degree, which is was pretty common at that time. And the best thing to do that was following the studies, veterinary studies to continue, find a good place to do a doctor's degree. And that was in the microbiology at that time. Um, so what I did at the same time was I, I didn't have a, have a job at the university. It was just the subject, the possibility mm -hmm. to do the thesis. And I financed myself. And I financed myself by going up to your birthplace, more or less, mm -hmm. and taking blood samples from cattle. Mm -hmm. Oh, they, you know, the farmers really love that, seeing a small, not that tall lady coming in and taking blood samples from a tail <laughs> vein. Yes. Yeah. I had lots and lots of visitors while I did that. Yeah. And then um, I, I went to small animal practice to do surgery and, and practice once a week. So I was like, um, the week has seven days, and uh, the the thesis was six days, and the uh, small animal practice was one day. Okay. Sometimes two. It depended on what the owner said. Well, can you stay for? Can you can you sleep over and do? I don't know what the next day. And then I I did that, and that was really much fun, and I I really enjoyed that. And actually, yeah. was you know thinking about a career um, wasn't really planned that well. Uh, so I, I always felt like I would, you know, continue to work in that practice. I really liked that. Um, was close to Bielefeld, and uh, so I had to go with the car. I had to go to 200 kilometers to, to the west, and uh, then it came to an end. And one of the employees in the microbiology uh, left, and then mm. everybody in the team said, "Well, why don't you apply for that job? You know everything, and you've been mm. here for." one and a half years and, and you're going to get the job. And I said, oh, do you think, do you really think I could get the job? And I'm not, I'm not really sure. And, um, and I said, why, why not? And yes, I'm really pretty sure and you could really fit in well. And at the same time, I felt like, well, you've got to think about what are you going to do when you're done with that thesis and you have to find a good job and you have to finance yourself in a pro more profound way. And mm. And the practitioner, practitioner didn't say anything. And so I finally said, well, well I'm going to try. And I applied for the job. I got the job and um, went to the clinic and said, well, by the way, I've got a job from then on. I'm going to go and be in the microbiology completely. And then he kind of said, well, I've, I always thought you'd come and join me. And why are you going to do that? Why now? didn't you said, well, say anything? You know, talking helps. <laughs> mm. Mm. So, so that was really then, more, more um, uh, it wasn't really planned that way. 
Yeah, so that was in the Institute of Microbiology at the university then. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. And and how did that come about then with LaboClean? Because you worked there then, and then did you hear then about the opportunity to take that lab over in Bad Kissing, or or how 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 were the early days of LaboClean then, or okay. what made you then making the big step? Okay, so it it really was. All sorts of, uh, all of that wasn't really planned that well. So I worked in the microbi microbiology. I enjoyed the um, developmental work and the service work there as well, doing good diagnostics for, for fellow colleagues. And um, and I felt like, well, this is a, it's a really um, satisfying work to help with a good diagnostic and help to, you know, help the colleagues to have good success because they get closer to their diagnosis and their, their treatment. And if you do that, you know, um, find out what kind of bacteria are relevant, find out which, which antibiotics work, that is very close to helping, supporting for success, really. So I thought mm -hmm. it was, that was really an interesting work. And uh, finished the further qualification for what we call Fachtiarzt in German. Mm -hmm. and, um, then I felt like, well, university was was uh, not giving that much freedom at that time. You know, you, you would have to apply. We, we, we always make jokes about you have to apply for a pencil. You have to apply for a piece of paper. It's, it's lots of uh, regulations and not that much work freedom, put it that mm -hmm. way. Um, and then uh, my what was it, what you'd call a doctor father, the, the guy mm -hmm. who supervised me during my, my doc doctorate thesis, he worked in a small pharmaceutical uh, enterprise close mm -hmm. by. And uh, he left for Bud Kissing and to follow his colleague in an enterprise that dealt with lots of hygiene and pharmaceutical product uh, um, quality control systems. So he did what the other colleagues said before. He said, well, I'm going to leave. Why don't you apply for my job? Because you know the place. Mm -hmm. And I said, again, oh, I don't know. Is that, is that really the right thing for me? And can I really mm -hmm. do that in front of cover mm -hmm. that? Um, ended up being um, a head of research development for a small pharmaceutical firm that dealt with microbiology products. Mm. So it was still mm. microbiology, but it was human medicine and pharmaceutics. Mm. Mm. Uh, stayed there for some years, did a lot of traveling, did a lot of uh, research, got a little bit more into uh, looking into the, the budgets and the finances in that way. And um, after two or three years, I felt like, well, this is um, human medicine and I would like to go a little bit back to my roots. And while I was still sitting there and thinking about what would be nice to go back to my roots, my telephone rang and... Um, yep. as, yeah. as it does, yes, yeah. As it does, so yeah. This, this it's always wise telephone to call that suddenly changes your life. Through exactly. this call, then suddenly your life takes completely different direction. Haven't, haven't we had it all at some point? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, it's always wise to pick it up. You can always say no in the end, right? So, and that was that was your former head of the department uh, who was already in butt kissing, who said, come on, Elizabeth, we need you down here. Yeah. Exactly. They said, well, th there is this veterinary lab that we all know, and the guy who leads it wants to go into retirement and... Um, we would like to to pick that business up, but we need somebody to to run it because we don't have time. Um, and once in my life, I said yes, but and I said yes, but I want to be part of it. I want to own part of it as well. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. And that's how it all started. So at the time when 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 you went down there, I don't know, was it already called LaboClean or did you? Uh, did you then agree to call it Labo Clean or? Yeah, that was night telephone sessions on what, what would be a good name. And we tried to find a good name because it was named after the owner and we couldn't carry on with the owner's name. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
they, we were kind of desperate and tried and fiddled around with all sorts of things and ended up with Laboclean saying, well, we don't know any better really in the end. So, and, and how, that, how many people were working there then at, at the very beginning? So there were you three, I think. I'm number 13. I'm still number 13. I have the direct line number 13 and I, ha I was the number 13. Okay. May I ask where, where, where are the numbers now? <laughs> the, we have currently we have um, a good 500 people employed. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that is, but that is just in but Kissingen, or is that uh, including also um, all your uh, smaller branches abroad? Um, I mean, there are also links to quite a few other countries where you also have laboratories. So that that all, is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, number 13. So you're still number 13, lucky yeah, 13 so there. No? You, you can always call me directly now because you know it's my direct line. Okay, good. I will, <laughs> I will remember that. That's good. So, so and then um, the uh, initially there were then three partners who who owned the uh, uh, who owned Labo Clean, but then the other two stepped back, or are they still sort of are, they, are you still part owner of or or are you how, how does it work? Because I mean, most of these large organizations they are now owned by. I don't know if, uh, if uh, venture capitalist companies or something like that, but but the Labo Clean is pretty much still privately owned, isn't it? It's hundred percent privately owned, and it's hundred percent in my hands. All right. Okay. Good. So that's an easy answer. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So so when so, so 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 when did that go completely into your into your hands? Was that already eighty nine, or was it then later? No, oh, that's 24 years ago. That was after several years. The, when we started, I was the active part in leading the business and the other yeah. two were the ones with business experience, supporting um, in, in the back and uh, definitely being the uh, insurance for the bank because I walked up to the, the, to the bank and said, I would like to open an account because I have to pay for... Um, uh, starting the business, right? Game behind, you have to put in money. So I said, I would yeah. like to open an account and I would like to draw money out of this account into the, uh, um, for, for, for starting the business. And then they said, well, what do you have as security? And I said, That's my <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but I mean the thing is, well, you you have to do that. I mean, what what I always recommend to my to my sons when I when I say, well, if you start a business or if you go to the banks to ask for money, always go first to a bank which is not on the top of the list uh, that you target, where you where you have a bank you really would like to work with. Don't go to them first. Go to to some other bank and pre present them with your business plan and then let rip have a look have a look what can you do how can you how can you push it what can you maybe there's there's a weakness in the way uh, uh, how you pitch your business and but but there's nothing to lose and and i found this is a really good training and the surprising thing is when i when i did that with my own clinic when i had to ask for money I later found actually that the, the first bank that I went to and I thought ah oh, they are they're probably they're unlikely to uh, to come up with a good offer they turned out the second best offer that I got partially because I went in with an attitude that I said okay there's nothing to lose and it yeah. makes it it makes it sort of easy because it is it can be pretty scary especially if your business plan is okay my security is me <laughs> and it's what's up in there and yeah i mean that's a brave thing to do mm -hmm. yeah but as we can see i mean it, it you seem to have succeeded very well mm -hmm. give, give give me an idea of of labo clean now i mean sort of do you have any idea sort of how many samples you are processing in a day or in a week or in a year or so if, to give me to give us an idea of the scale of this now? Um, so it's um, in, in Bad Kissing, we have several thousand samples per day. 
Mm. Uh, and then, of course, we have our satellite labs in other European countries. Mm. And the setup is really that um, uh, the, the idea in, in these European countries is that wherever it's, it's a good idea to have local support for the, for the vet veterinarians in these countries. We, we set up a lab there and this lab will not cover everything. They will mm. cover the stuff that you need quick and uh, where we have, um, uh, so you need, if you have a short turnover time and where you can produce for a reasonable price and all the exotic stuff sort of is sent over um, uh, with an overnight career on a daily basis so that everything else will be carried out um, with one day delay, which sounds like a disadvantage in the beginning. But if you look at uh, any specialty that we run, we run almost every specialty every day, which you would never be able to do at this small lab. So mm. that's the, the overnight transport is compensated very well that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it is. Uh, I think one one of the the the, the really st uh, areas that 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 uh, evolved a lot over the last fifty or twenty years is DNA testing. I think there's a lot. Uh, it's, it's the tests sort of coming. I mean, yeah, I, in virtually every month you you come up with uh, with, with new tests. Yeah. Um, uh, so and obviously sort of PCRs 20, 25 years ago or something like that were probably uh, fairly sort of yeah rare or strange sort of tests. So, face the fact, did you ever learn PCR at university? No, 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 no. I, I didn't not. either. And I went to, I remember me going visiting summer school in Utrecht because I thought, well, this is coming up now and I have to know how that works, how this functions, this methods, this pretty new method. And now we run like several thousand PCRs per day. Oh, yeah. um, so <laughs> that there's so much, there's been so much change with DNA tests. So that was something really fancy. Now it's, it's easy to reach really. And it's two to three new DNA tests per month that we come up with. Uh, interestingly enough, one last one, you like to go to Sweden, right? And uh, we just had a collaboration with some uh, um, colleague in, in, in Sweden who came up with a, a bleeding issue with, with Rhodesian rich bats and said, well, there's a family, they, they have a bleeding issue. We are pretty sure that's the hemophilia. And um, we had set up hemophilia tests we, and, and, and got some samples and screened them and found the mutation. And that's just accepted by PLOS One, which is a pretty good journal for publication. So. Yeah, 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 just really fresh. That's just a week ago. <laughs> yeah, 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 and I mean, also a far cry from 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 microbiology where you where you started actually. You now that's true. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. So um, that's veterinary medicine, but but uh, how is that now with uh, human medicine? Do you also run at your labs tests for uh, uh, for human hospitals, and especially also in how far? Were you involved or affected by by COVID nineteen? Okay, so if you would have asked me a year ago, I would have said, "Well, we are veterinarians, and we we are privately owned. We just concentrate on veterinary medicine. This is one of our big strengths. That it's our core business: veterinary medicine. Everything that the practitioner can uh, can be of help." Um, then COVID came, mm. and. Um, I chatted with uh, uh, the local vet, uh, local uh, medicine authorities really and told them, well, you, you know that if there ever is a need, that's a technique, that's PCR technique. That's what we do several hundred thousand or thousands uh, times per day. It's nothing mm -hmm. that's very particular. And it's a little bit a different setup in terms, terms of uh, security for the humans involved, but uh, we have the, um, you know, you, you need permits of safe security, safety uh, uh, work, and we have the permit already. We we could yeah. technically and, and uh, theoretically you, mean, we could work you, you with were, that every day. You were working um, for years with zoonotic diseases, anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So it's it's just a zoonotic disease, more or less, right? Mm. Um, and they said, well, yeah, thank you. Very interesting. 
leave us alone, right? Mm -hmm. And then they had all these uh, pandemic meetings and organizational meetings in the counties. And uh, uh, funny enough, the uh, head of the police called me one day and said, by the way, I'm going to attend one of these pandemic organizational meetings this afternoon. And um, police people are uh, always trying to find solutions. Mm, and I would mm. like to know, could you help us with solutions? And I said, well, actually, yes. And actually they know already, but obviously they didn't, weren't really interested that much in it, but greetings and we could help. And it ended up with us starting to uh, implement COVID testing. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we are registered for COVID testing for the, um, uh, funny enough, for all the uh, testing that is done by the local authorities. So, you know, the, the uh, uh, first contact people, for instance, that have to be tested when somebody is positive or the, um, testing in uh, elderly homes when there is some suspect cases or in hospitals when there are some, some cases or um, so that all that stuff, the, the, uh, um, the testing that is um, supervised by the local authorities, that's something that what we do. We don't test, we are not licensed for testing sick people. Mm -hmm. And that is um, uh, an issue concerning the um, um, health uh, health insurance health insurance won't pay for that i guess sort of i i, I sometimes surprised I and mean, we're talking about uh, the one health philosophy which is endorsed by by uh, both the human medical and by also the the veterinary authorities and we say yeah we all pull in the same direction but when it comes to something like a global pandemic by uh, 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 it comes to um, a coronavirus infection i mean we, 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 uh, which might be fairly sort of unusual to deal with for for human uh, uh, doctors, but but we have been dealing with coronavirus infections ah. sort of for many many years. So I sometimes uh, and and then for example, I mean you you have you have a fully functional lab there which is prepared to deal with thousands of samples on a daily basis. You can say, well, we have the capacity PCRs we run for many years, so that it takes and the local police. <laughs> <laughs> the chief to say, um, okay, the doctors and the health authorities were not interested, but actually, why not? And sort of, yeah, it, it needs yeah. to, it, it, it sometimes requires people that have actually nothing to do with health, then to say, wait a moment, why are you holding back with veterinary, uh, with the veterinary yeah. sector? I mean, there are a lot of things. Yes, we are not human yeah. doctors, but I think we can contribute in the effort and I think the opportunities have been missed once again and that will happen mm. in the future as well. I think uh, they were quite quite quick in the end so we started COVID testing in March and our uh, chief of the county actually uh, got all the honors from the uh, minister president from Bavaria because he yeah. was the first one <laughs> setting up a very efficient system so uh, it all turned out nice in the end, but and, and it's still the way that uh, um, we have our uh, Red Cross cars driving by and the fire squad driving by with uh, sets of samples, and we pride ourselves of never taking more than a day to run the run the tests. So we have a pretty good turnover time, um, and it's an interesting sort of business. I mean, once it's it's been from the beginning on, it's been very close to, to humans. You know, when somebody calls you and says, could you have a look and maybe it, it can you give it, give the result quicker because there is somebody who is going to the operation theater. We know, we need to know what kind of precautions we, we have to take or there's mm -hmm. somebody in an elderly home dying. We, we need to know what kind of precautions do we have to take with the, with the daughter sitting beside the bed. Mm -hmm. Something like that. and it's very touching, really. And then you feel like this is um, uh, what what is medicine all about, isn't it? It's about veterinary medicine, and it's the same about human medicine that you try to help as good as you can. Um, and that that's uh, yeah. It, and, and at the same time, of course, it was 
uh, quite interesting to fo to to see how quick can you you know organize that. It's when there is one test type of sample coming in a thousand to two thousand times per day, and you want to run them as quick as possible, and material gets scarce. We've been all of us being. I think practices as well. We've been in the situation where there was no swab available, where there was no um, tube available, where, where we had shortages with all sorts of stuff, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Completely but, the, but these are the moments where, where, where it takes sort of this can-do attitude. I mean, that, that you clearly, <laughs> I mean, sort of have. I mean, it yeah. is, I mean, it's also, I mean, as, it, as some of our listeners know, Labo Clean is also sponsoring our um, uh, Fekava Veterinary Travel Scholarship, uh, which allows veterinarians from one country in Europe to travel to another country of, in, in Europe to, to meet up with, with colleagues. And okay, probably a bit difficult in, at the moment. But yeah, it right is now that's sort of, difficult. Once COVID is out of the way, so this will again sort of uh, pick, uh, be picked up again. And I mean, it is, I had the, sort of when starting this scholarship, I, I had the great fortune in bumping into you and and, and speaking to you. And you, you're one of these people who said, okay, how does it work? Let's do it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's true. You know, uh, see, during my studies and my vet studies, I felt like, okay, I'm stuck in Hanover, to put it that way. I really like that. I like my university in Hanover, that would no, no sure. But I felt like um, I, I want to see what it, what veterinary life is like in different places. So all the seeing practice times I spent in either Britain or in the States, and I saw so different attitude and different work life. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so interesting. And actually, um, I learned a lot more in these practices than I would have been able to learn at the same time during the studies in Germany, because studying was set up in these countries different so they expected me to be more proficient in working yeah so yeah. i ended up being more proficient in working <laughs> i <laughs> also i i always thought that it's so so good to see different ways different countries different uh, um, expectations definitely yeah. It's also, I've, I, I felt when working a different uh, language from sort of uh, my sort of native German, I possibly had to engage more with the subject I was talking about. It was because you had sometimes you had to read, um, you had to concentrate more when you were reading or saying something, you had to engage a little bit more. And that made a difference, sort of both, I mean, in my case in English or also in Norwegian, for example, I've, I've, I've really had then to, to understand what I was reading, not only the language, but also the subject. And that's, uh, yes, it's draining, but it is, uh, uh, it, it makes a difference. And as you said, sort of expectations are often so much different and uh, and attitudes and also the caseload is obviously different mm -hmm. so Absolutely, yeah yeah and it's, no, it's uh, I've, I've kind of pulled that into my life now i see but kissing is a small town with twenty two thousand inhabitants yeah. and we have so many we have people employed from so many different countries and some and we have students coming from different countries and uh, we send our uh, um, apprentices, we, we we have apprentices in different jobs, so lab job, office job, IT job, and we send them to different, uh, with the Erasmus program, we send them to different countries coming back and they enjoy just being somewhere else for some weeks and finding out what is, what do their profession look like in a different yeah. country, in a different setting. Yeah. And that's always enrichment, I think, for both sides. And yet, I mean, also the, I find it so, so nice. I mean, let's talk a little bit about the Elizabeth away from, from Labo Clean and, and your work there. I mean, sort of you talking about people who come from different uh, backgrounds to work at Labo Clean. I saw that you are, for example, also one of the initiators of the New Citizens Round Table in Bad Kissingen. So if people move to Bad Kissingen, then to say, okay, I've been a newcomer. I come from a different part of uh, of Germany. 
sort of if you want to meet new people, want to make new friends, sort of then there is there is this sort of round table for, for newcomers. So, so mm -hmm. I thought you're organizing something like this. I also saw uh, you, 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 you are politically active. Uh, uh, I saw this is democratic citizens of uh, Kissingen. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a sort of a free voter um, uh, yeah. party or, okay. So where, where, where do you find the time for all this? How do you do it? It's always time yeah. left, isn't it? I yeah, work yeah. with the veterinary chamber and I'm engaged there with the, uh, uh, through the education scheme program there to evaluate that. Um, yeah. That's fun being in the in the veterinary chamber in, of Bavaria and being mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the vice president of the local veterinary chamber. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. With that Landestierzekammer, Bayern. Uh, Landestierze Kammer Bayern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a delegate there. And then yeah. we have these smaller, we break down these smaller Meetings. groups to the local yeah. group uh, that's Unterfranken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm, I'm within the board of the Unterfranken veterinarian. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's yeah. why they have their educational service now online during the COVID time, because I said, well, we've set, set up so many online service for, for educational schemes from Laboclean. And why not? give this group the chance to, you know, have the, the podium, the online podium for some further education. Um, and we had great meetings this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how, how would you say sort of has COVID affected you personally? Because I mean, I have to say, I have the great advantage at the moment in Bavaria after nine o'clock is a lockdown. So I was no, I, hate that one. I don't like that one. Everything else, there's some goods and with COVID, yes. Mm. But I hate the nine o'clock thing. I have to yeah. you know, but because the I'm a late for, worker and I the like advantage, to, the advantage for me you was, the advantages. Okay. Yeah, um, the advantage for me was that I knew okay tonight Elizabeth might be at home so she can, because she can't go out because I mean this is I mean you, you, everybody who will listen to this sees you you are a real people person you if you 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 unite people you connect people you like to interact with people you uh, 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 it's I mean I always I mean we we might meet once a year or maybe once every six months somewhere you know, as I said last time Toronto or wherever we will meet again but it's always so easy to talk to you and I mean if uh, it's something like COVID I have to say personally I yes I like these online meetings but I'm missing yeah. also oh, yeah. the, the physical contact with people sort of meeting people over a nice meal in a restaurant or or I don't know it, I, I miss dancing obviously so, so the yeah. good yeah, yeah. party and things like that so but how, how has it affected you? Yeah, I, I, I definitely miss people. I, I miss interactions. I, I think that, you know, 50% of my, uh, what I gain from um, from congresses or seminars, what, what I, I take out of that in, in terms of what I enjoy is really interaction with people. And um, all of that is gone. And, and this online meeting is just a, um, a pretty poor uh, uh replacement of, of what we used to have. And I think that's pretty similar for most of um, our colleagues that we feel we want to interact one by one. We want to sit, stand in small groups. We enjoy somebody else coming by that we didn't know, find out who that is, interconnect in a different way. So all of that is missing. Um, but what COVID for me meant really is, yes, I was kind of redefined being stuck at home. Uh, I can't remember having been so many nights at home in my own bed in a row. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Um, and besides that, it was a really, really big challenge. You know, we've been going on and on and developing things and changing things, making the lab bigger, maybe more effective, trying to um, erase all our little mistakes or what, whatever is not going fine in order to, you know, keep up the, the standard or getting that better, but it was kind of going on and on. And then all of a sudden, everything was questioned. We had like, I think six weeks where we had 
50% of the sample load that we had before. We had to reorganize in terms of not getting infection, you know, get, getting reducing the risk of infection spreading through the lab. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of very, very detailed work on that. We started with a lot more home office than we had. We've always, we've got all sorts of prizes for having different types of uh, um, uh, work careers within the the lab with you know part time and so all sorts of uh, versions. But we did introduce lots more of home office places, changed a lot there, and then we started changing or finding new ways of interaction because all of us we like to interact with our colleagues. So we started with. Um, uh, 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 web series, the interesting case, which we still run, which we will probably run for a longer time because we really like that. It's just mm -hmm. half an hour, an interesting case for free. Whoever wants to come in can, can come in. Started that in German, then we started that in English, then we thought about the technicians, the, the, um, the, the, the work team and started a really, it's really a, a funny and very casual way of, for uh, technicians with uh, our youngsters and veterinarians to talk about different subjects like how to centrifuge best, how to avoid hemolysis, how to whatever, how to identify cells in a microscope. And uh, so we, we started all sorts of new features really. Mm. Um, started in uh, what I think is a really nice newsletter that is uh, just combining links of scientific papers that or of papers that are concerned with um, diseases uh, and uh, as well as uh, uh, work environment, what has changed there, how to deal with uh, uh, different work situations. Um, we've been changing that a little bit in this year to not sending out these in information on a weekly basis anymore, but it's still going out. And there's, you'll find something about uh, COVID vaccines or COVID in cats or in dogs or in ferrets or in whatever. Um, so we, we've changed a lot. And, and yeah. I, what yeah. I really yeah. like is these one of these Chinese sayings, you know, when there is the, the water flows around the stone, it, uh, if there is a stone, you just flow around. And, and that's what we try to do. But it is, I mean, what we have to do, adapt, adapt. Yeah. If, you, if you can't adapt, you are history. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, yeah. That, well, that's, that's the way it is. I mean, you have to make the most out of the situation you get. And uh, I mean, it's, yeah, the situation might not be great, but, but there might be things you can do to make it at least a little bit better. Uh, and, and if you don't try at least to, to, to make an effort to make it better, then don't be surprised if it, if it, if it gets you down. I, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it might be hard, but, but you have to get out of your comfort zone, I think, and then just, just <laughs> give it a try. And I mean, as, as it shows with you, I mean, sort of starting at number 13, <laughs> now sort of having a team of 500 people and being one of the largest labs in Europe. Yeah. So it's, uh, you, 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 you don't get there if you don't from time to time take risks and to also adapt, I think. Mm -hmm. But actually, I think quite often it's, it's more or less, uh, how do you define your comfort zone? Um, if my comfort zone really is, I, I, I like to ask questions. I'm a nosy person. Mm -hmm. And um, for some time, I didn't really always have the money to find time or people, resources to, to, to get question, the answers for questions. And, um, you know, the, the bigger a lab gets, the more samples you have, the more interesting samples you have per day. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the easier it gets to find answers to questions. And uh, uh, then a pandemia, for instance, is something where there's so many questions on that. So we started looking into cats and samples from cats with respiratory tract symptoms. And we, we thought, well, why not look for, for SARS-CoV-2? Because we can do SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. We have these samples. We want to know what, what happens with these cats. Mm. Um, 
And we just included that as a blind test for, for, for uh, a lot of uh, samples to find out whether or not there would be some positives and could then sort of, you know, uh, uh, take people the fear and say, well, with all these samples we looked into, we didn't find positive samples. So don't worry about that too much. And that was pretty concordant with the literature that, that came up. Um, then we started looking into serum samples and I said, well, what, what about the serum samples of these cats? Because obviously they can be infected and they are not just clinically ill. Um, so what is the prevalence of that? And, and we looked into that and uh, then we start, found two different groups who were interested in that, university groups who were interested in, the, in, in that. Um, so there was resulted in a, in a poster at the South European Veterinary Congress on uh, results of our PCR work with different uh, species and now there is a work uh, being put together with uh, serum samples from different countries um, mm. different regions where there where a lot of humans exposed in order to find out how much of um, interconnection has been there um, I like to ask questions I like to find yeah. people who like to work with me and I like mm -hmm. to find the answers. Sometimes it's frustrating you don't find answers, but quite often you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. On this note, Elizabeth, thank you very much for speaking to me at Fekava Vet Chat. That was just so interesting. If anyone has any further questions or would like to comment on this episode of Fekava Vet Chat, you can do so by emailing us on vetchat at fekava.com or you can post it on our Facebook site or send us a message via Twitter as well. So uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth, and I hope that I see everybody uh, again uh, next week for another interesting Fikava Vet Chat. Bye-bye. Thank you. It was a pleasure.